So you'd think, you would think that writing object-oriented code was hard. All you have to do is look at our apps, right? We mean well, and but we write code that almost always, inevitably, inevitably, we eventually come to hate it. And the more I think about this, like these days somehow my job is to think about how to write better code. And the more I think about it, the more I think that all of the problems we cause have the same simple solution. And that when people ask me now, when people ask me how to write object-oriented code, I tell them, I give them one small piece of advice. I say, make smaller things. That's all it is. Make smaller classes, make smaller methods, and let them know as little about each other as possible. And lately I've been on a quest. I've had this obsession for the last couple of months, and it's been about conditionals. There's a lot of code out there with nasty conditionals in it. And I've been wondering, when should I replace conditionals with small objects? And how should I do this? And what will happen to my code if I do? And I was at RubyConf in Miami in November, and I inflicted this obsession upon Jim Wyrick, whom some of you probably knew. And he pointed me in the direction of the Gilded Rose. Now, this is a kata. It's apparently really well known, but I don't get out much, so I had <laughs> never heard of it. And so it's, it's so famous that you can just Google it and uh, get an explanation of the problem. But I didn't do that. I, I wanted to treat this problem as if it was a real production problem and that my only source of information was the tests and the code. And so I uh, looked at his, I, I checked it out of his repo, and I looked at the problem, and I was so interested in it that it became the skeleton around which I, I have hung the ideas for today's talk. Um, I have altered his code just a little bit, but it's just to make it easier to talk about. This really is the Gilded Rose Kata. And here's how it goes. There's a Gilded Rose class, and it's structured like this. It has attributes for name, quality, and days remaining. It sets those in an initializer, and then there's a tick method. Now, here's the tick method. Well, actually, no, that's just the first half of it. Here's the rest. Now, I know you can't read this. You should, well, don't even try, even if you can. All right? This is the whole method. I just want you to get some sense of the size and shape of it. It's a 43-line if statement. And this seems really, really hard to me, but I am known to be Boolean impaired. So I know that my subjective sense of how difficult this is to understand is probably not correct. And so instead, I ran, I used some metrics. I ran a complexity metric called flog against it. So flog is a metric. OK, what's a metric? A metric is a crowdsourced idea about something, right? I have my own opinion about how compl complex this is. But I can use this sort of wisdom of the crowd metric, the, uh, the flog metric, which scores, it's an ABC metric. So it scores assignments, branches, and conditionals. It just counts things and adds them up. Higher scores are worse. They indicate uh, more complex code, code that's going to be harder to understand and reason about. And so Flog says this Gilded Road class scored a 50, and that one method, Tick, scored a 45. Yeah, it just hurts, doesn't it? So, so Flog says it's complicated. But before we go on, I want to introduce another, a very subjective metric about complexity. So I spend a lot of time these days going, um, going to places and looking at code I know nothing about. People call me up, and I go to their shop, and I spend a few days. And as you might imagine, no one calls me if things are going well. Right? <laughs> and when I get there, they don't ask me to look at the code they're proud of. They ask me to look at the most heinous bits of their apps, the, th the things that have sort of complex, lengthy context and history, code that has just absolutely gotten out of hand. And not only are the explanations long and confusing because the problem is hard, but they do that thing we all do. You know that thing you do when you're trying to, when you have to explain a bit of code that you wrote that you're embarrassed about to someone? You don't just tell them how it works. You feel compelled to explain all the reasons why it got that way. Right? You laugh. I do it. I know you do it too, right? It just hurts. We hate that. And so these explanations are long and confusing, and they have lots of sort of you know, sideways kind of information. And there's a point in time, I really mean well, but there's a point in time during every explanation when I start feeling like that dog, Ginger, in this Gary Larson's cartoon, where I, it starts turning into blah, 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 Sandy, blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly I get startled back into awareness when I hear them say, so... What do you think we should do about this line of code? <laughs> and they used to terrify me, right? I felt like I had to understand everything in order to help with anything. 
But it turned out, after a few trips, I realized that there was a really simple thing I could do that would help me identify code that they could benefit from changing. And I call this the squint test. <laughs> Here's how it works. You squint your eyes, and you lean back, and you look at the code. And we're looking for changes in shape <laughs> and changes in color. Changes in shape mean you have nested conditionals, and they are always going to be hard to reason about. Changes in color mean that your code is at differing levels of abstraction. And it means the story it tells is going to be hard to follow. Now, what is it about this code? Well, it has 16 if statements. Seven of those are not equal. Two of them connect something with an and. There are three magic strings. They're used all over, and a number of magic numbers. I don't even know how many. <laughs> now, at least it has tests. Oh, I'm sorry. And here are the magic strings. These three things, Brie, Sulfurous, and Backstage Passes, whatever that means. And it does have tests, and they pass. Now, there are six skip tests, all right? So I don't know, I don't know what that's about. And so I, I probably open the code. I just look at this first test. Oh, I'm sorry. The tests cluster around the magic strings, except for this set, which is for something called normal, which is never mentioned in the if statement. I suspect there's something in an else branch somewhere that matters here, all right? So I, I probably open a test and I look at it. Here's one. They all look just like this. I'm selling something, okay. Given a gilded rose that has this name, attribute, and quality, those are our three uh, adder readers. When, when I tick, in this case, quality goes down by one, days remaining goes down by one. They both go down by one. So it's, it's as if the, I'm selling milk or eggs or cheese or something that has a sell-by date that's going to expire where you know, they go bad at some date. OK, so I'm still exploring around, trying to figure out. I don't even know what my job is yet, right? And so I open, I look at the six skip tests, and they're for something called conjured. <laughs> and they all follow the same pattern. All the tests look kind of like, given that, when I tick, I see this change. And I realize, at this point, I realize, holy crap, I'm supposed to change this code. <laughs> now, and so I tried. I tried. Very obediently, I tried. But I was a miserable failure. I couldn't do it. That 43 line if statement defeated me. Every time I went, I would like pry open a conjure test and I'd go make some change in that if statement to make that test pass, it would break something else. I spent hours on it. Now I am impaired, but really it was hard. It would be hard for you too, I think. And so if changing that if statement was so hard, you have to ask, why was I trying? Why did I try to do it? What possessed me? to try to alter that incredibly complicated bit of code? And the answer is I felt like I was supposed to. And here's what happens, right? You write some code. Someone asks for a change. What do we do? You go look around in the code base for a code that lo that's the closest thing to the new thing you're trying to do. And you put the new code there. That's how we behave. Novices especially, they're afraid to make new objects. So they just go put more code in where they can find a thing like the thing they're trying to add. And if that place already has an if statement, they just put another branch on it. All right? That's how it works. And, and what happens is, so the natural tendency of code is to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And there comes a point, right? It gets big and big and big. There comes a point where it tips. Where, and at that point, it's so big that you cannot imagine putting code anywhere else. We have a bargain to follow the pattern. And if the pattern is a good one, code gets better. And if the pattern is a bad one, we exacerbate the problem. Nobody adds a 10-line helper class to a 5,000-line active record object. They just get bigger. Once they reach a certain size, they just get bigger. And so I could not follow the pattern. I was not good enough to follow the pattern. And so I decided I was going to make a new pattern, that I was going to refactor this code. Now, this is real refactoring according to the definition of refactoring. I'm going to refactor this code. I'm going to change its arrangement without altering its behavior. I'm not going to try to add conjured. I'm going to try to move this code around so that I can add conjured. And for refactoring, for refactorings like this, tests are the wall at your back. You've got to have tests or you don't know what you're doing. And so I'm just going to start at the top. I'm going to start with these normal tests. And I got this code. This is what tick looks like. Now, this is a big, long procedure. This is not object-oriented code. In object-oriented code, you have lots of little objects, and you send messages between them. And those messages give you a level of indirection so that you can substitute different objects at the back. Messages create seams so that you can do a different thing. And there is no seam here because this is a procedure. And so the first thing I have to do if I want to refactor is I have to make a seam. 
And I'm going to do that just by trapping normal and bailing. At this point, four tests should fail. And they do. All right? And I am not about to add more code to the tick method. So I'm just going to send a message to myself. And four tests should still fail. And they do. And so now that I believe I have caught that execution path, I'm going to just break open the first test, and I'm going to write the code to make it pass. Quality goes down by one. That's easy enough. I can write that code. Days remaining goes down by one. And that test passes. All right? One down, three to go. Here's the next test. In this case, it looks like I'm out of time. It's, I'm on the sale by date, so now quality goes down by two. So I'll just make sure my old test keeps on passing. And I'll write code to make this test pass. And so now I think two, two tests should pass. I should have two failures. But something I just did made some test I haven't looked at pass. And we love that. I'm not even going to look at it. <laughs> right? I don't need to understand it. I got tests. OK, so I'm going to just go, I'm going to make this one pass. Right? I'll just open the last one. So this one says, if, there, if quality is already 0, don't change it. And so I'm just going to wrap this whole thing in an if statement and not do anything if quality is 0. OK, so now I'm back to green. That code was not smart or clever, but that's the whole point. Once I get to green, I can now refactor. So my goal is to get to green as quickly as possible. Red is not when you ponder the abstraction. Red is when you scramble toward green. You're trying to reach to the, for the lowest hanging green here. And so I got there. I'm at green now. And I confess to you already that I'm Boolean impaired. And I've written code that even I, at this moment, do not understand. But now I'm green so I can refactor. It looks to me like they always subtract one from days remaining. So I'm going to do that first. I like that story better. It looks to me like uh, if quality, they don't do anything. They, I, I can just bail if quality is 0. So I can take that whole outer nesting out of that if statement. And now once I get to here, I can ponder these two remaining cases. Are there two cases here? Is there a case where I subtract one from quality and two from quality? Or is this, I, I don't think so. Now that I look at it this way, I think I always subtract one from quality. And there's a special case in which I subtract another if I'm past the sell by date. And so I can just delete all that code. And now I have this, which is all at the same level of abstraction. And I can understand it. I love the story this code tells. It's very simple. It was easy to get here. And now my tests still pass. All right, so we're going to do this over and over again much more quickly than this one. I'm going to just take you through a quick reprise here. So I, I create a seam. I sent a message to myself. I trapped all the execution paths into here. I wrote some code. I hated it. I got to green as quick as possible. And then I used green to let me refactor to code that was sensible. And now normal's done. All the normal tests pass. And so now I'm just going to bust right through all the other cases. Here's Bree. There's a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to turn that into a case statement so I can trap Bree. There's seven tests, so they're all failing now. So I have confidence that I've caught them. I'm going to write the code, but you don't even need to look at it because you can see how easy it is, right? Now that, I've iso now that I'm ha only having to write uh, code for one test at a time, it's pretty simple to write the code. What I end up with looks like this. And now Bree's done. Now, and now a really interesting thing happens. When, it, when this stuff was buried in the 43 line if statement, I had no idea the ways in which normal and Bree were alike. But now that I'm using this, they seem a lot alike to me. Now, there's differences sort of in the driving data here, but the algorithm, you can see the shape of the algorithm here. The algorithm is really the same. And it is very tempting. We, we have been, we've had the dry roll browbeat into us so strongly. It's very tempting at this point. I'm on a road. I'm on a refactoring road. It's very tempting now to go on a tangent and try to clean this up. Because we believe the greatest, we've been taught like the greatest virtue is dry. And I would tell you that's the wrong idea here. I'm about to get a lot more information about what this algorithm looks like. I, and I, want, I need to finish the refactoring I'm on before I go on any tangents. So I'm going to notice that similarity but, uh, and keep the duplication and just keep on going down this path and see where it leads. And this brings me to my first big point of this talk. It is far cheaper to keep duplication than it is to have to mess with the wrong abstraction. The first rule we teach novices is don't repeat yourself dry. And, but have you ever thought about why we teach them that rule? It's because they can't understand anything else. 
They don't know anything. But by God, they can recognize duplication. And it's a good rule. I'm not saying it's a bad rule. But I'm saying that it's now you're grown up. You know more. And with a, with a, you have enough experience now to tolerate a little duplication and wait on a better abstraction. It's really hard to deal with the wrong abstraction. I often make a, I make a dupe tag. You know how you can make a to-do tag? Like the pro people say, oh, I'm going to lose track of my duplication. Well, fix that problem. Like make a dupe tag and, and give every dupe like a number. So if you have a code, the same code in six, you know, in two or three places, like if that's the sixth instance of duplication, give it an ID like a database and put dupe six in a bunch of places in your code. You'll know. You'll see the duplication if you change a part. Like fix the problem of not being able to find it rather than reaching too soon for an abstraction. It's much easier to deal with the duplication. All right, so moving on. Here's Sulfurs. There's three tests. You would think if I uh, put my shim in and put an empty method, I would have three test failures. <laughs> and yet they all pass. So what's this about? Well, I look at the tests, and I realize that all the tests assert that nothing happens if it's sulfurous. Now, I, again, I had no idea when I was looking at that 43 line of statement that, not, that, that somehow it all asserted that nothing happened. So it turns out this is the code that makes the test pass. How nice is that? We love that, OK? So here's backstage. There's a whole bunch of these, and it looks like this. That's the code that makes a test pass. And so now we're totally back to green. This looks exactly like it did when I started. And this is what I got, right? I put this case statement in the front that trapped all the execution paths. I have a bunch of methods that look like this uh, that I created and added to the Gilded Rose class. And the rest of the tick method still contains that monstrous 43 line if statement which I don't understand, but I no longer need, so I'm just going to delete it. It's gone. Now, if you don't have good tests, this may freak you out. And then, but then, if you feel freaked out by this and you don't have good tests, you, you're really making a choice here, right? If you have code that you don't understand and that you're afraid to change, you can keep it forever if you think that's a good idea, or you can put some kind of test harness around it so that you can refactor. Like keeping it forever is not really a good choice. So you want to get to the point where you have confidence that you can safely refactor, and then you, but, and it means you never have to understand that code. You can do characterization tests around the edges to, it, so that you'll have green, you'll have a wall at your back for tests, and then you can refactor your way to the point where you can delete the code that you don't understand. And the moral of the story is that small methods are simple. Here we have, this is the code we just wrote. On, this is the squint test version. Don't try to read it. It's code we just wrote on the right. This is how we started on the left. You notice that the, the shape is flat, and the colors are starting to cluster. Now, I, again, I believe in metrics, because I know that my, my personal notion of what is simple or complex is just my opinion. And I, I totally know that metrics are fallible, but human opinion is no more precise. And that metrics are kind of a crowdsourced idea of what a bunch of people thought a metric could be. It's a useful data point for me to compare to my own. The original class flogged to 50, and this new class flogs to 40. But that overstates its complexity, because now there's a bunch of methods. The most complex method in it is backstage, and it flogs to 12. This code's way simpler. Well, this is great. And you'd think everyone would just do this. And so it's an interesting question why they don't. Now, one of the things I already told you, I already gave you one reason, right? We do more of what's there. And so um, the tendency is to add more to the if statement if that's there. But I think, I think there's another reason why we don't undertake these refactorings. And it's because of this. I'm just going to make the 50 smaller and move it over. This, I did t it took me 10 refactoring steps to get from the big conditional to a, bunch of, to a bunch of small methods. And here's the flog score of all the intermediate steps. All the intermediate refactorings made code more complicated. I know that I'm going to get to that 40. I understand the principles of object-oriented design, and I know the value of small methods. And because of that, I believe in the refactorings, and that lets me tolerate the intermediate complexity. But if you don't know, if you haven't learned about the value of small methods, it's hard to undertake those intermediate steps. They seem like um, academic things that people will do that uh, are, for the, are, are for some pie-in-the-sky principle that don't improve code. But I can promise you that if you can see far enough to see the end, to the end, this intermediate complexity leads to ultimate simplicity. And so now I'm going to circle back around my task. Now that I've done this refactoring, I can circle back around to my original task, which is to implement Conjure. How should I do this? 
Here's what I got. I got this. Should I do that? It would be easy. It would be really easy. But the answer to that is no, I should not do that. That is not the way I should solve this problem. And it's because this code is not open closed. It's not open for extension and closed for modification. Open closed supplies the O in solid, and it is, and I'm going to say it right out loud, it's a principle of object oriented design. It's one of the pieces of accumulative wisdom created by folks who've written a mountain of object oriented code, and they've ex they have experienced every possible kind of programming pain. And over time, they have noticed some principles, and they developed a style guide about how to organize code. That's what object-oriented design is. That's what the rules of object-oriented design are. There is, it's a style guide about how to organize code with all the obvious trade-offs, all the places where you can make your own decisions. In this case, you can feel free to ignore their discoveries, in which case you'll get to experience all that pain over again for yourself. That's what will happen. On the macro level, this style guide says it's best to arrange code so that adding new behavior does not require that you edit existing code. I know that seems impossible. I'm going to say it again, right? Open close says you ought to be able to add new behavior without editing existing code. Now, forget about how impossible that seems for a minute. I just want you to imagine something for me. Imagine in the world, imagine your apps, if that is true. Imagine that you can add new behavior without editing existing code. Think about what that means. It means you always have green tests. It means you're always safe. It means you never break, you never cause some distant and unrelated side effect. That is a sweet, sweet world if your code is open closed. And so on the macro level, we're trying to get to the point where we can add new behavior without editing existing code. And on the micro level, what that means here, right now, in this code, is that when we see methods that have a repeating prefix or repeating suffix, there's a tortured object in there that's trying to get out. Right here, in this place, you're about to make a decision that's going to have consequences that echo through your code base forever. Are you going to write procedures, or are you going to trust objects? If you insist on having all the logic visible right here where you can see it, you're insisting really on knowing both the condition on which you switch and the thing that you do, the action that you take when that switch happens. If you're uncomfortable, unless you know both those things at once in this file, under your eyes in this code, then you're going to be forced to add a new method right here. You have to put that conjured tick method right here. But if you don't, if you're okay with that, you can listen to object-oriented design. And it says that when you have differing prefixes and common suffixes, that what you really have is a normal class that ought to have a method tick. And that gilded rows ought to be holding on to an instance of it. And it is really easy to write that code. If you can think of that thing, thinking of the thing is far harder than writing the code. Here's how the code looks. I got this normal tick method. I'm just going to call it tick. I'm going to put in a normal class. I'm going to throw all the cruft in there to get the initialization and the, att the attributes defined. I'm going to go back into gilded rows in the normal tick method there. I'll get an instance of my new class, and I'll forward this message. Boom. That's it. All right, well, so I got this, but now I'm, so normal's an object, but nothing else is. And I'm about to go back on that path where I have to increase intermediate complexity. Because look what just happened, all right? I got this, my new normal tick method looks like this. It uses this item class, but Brie, the Brie tick method is still calculated inside the gilded rows. The quality and days remaining are part of the public API for gilded <laughs> rows, and so now I have to say, well, if I have an item, go get the item's quality, otherwise get the one I know about. And I have to do the same thing for days remaining. All right? It looks messy, but it's short term. It will go away. And so let's just walk through all the other objects. Now that you understand this pattern, it's really easy, right? Class Brie, move method tick, put the cruft in there for the message. Easy enough. This is really interesting. This is, now some trust is coming into play, right? I have an empty method. Look what I have to do. Make a new class, put the method in it, pry this method open, get an instance of that class forward the message. You can forgive it. You can be forgiven for being suspicious about this. But if you trust the refactorings, you'll have confidence that it's going to turn out well in the end. I'm, just, I'm not going to diverge. I'm not taking a detour. I'm going to go all the way down this path and finish this refactoring. 
backstage, I'll make the tick method, I'll move that stuff, I'll do the forwarding. All right, so now they're all objects and I got this. And I'm back here. So now, in the beginning, I didn't put, I, I moved uh, logic into methods of their own because I didn't want to uh, put a bunch of code in this case statement. But now that I have objects, everything is simpler, and I'm going to just start rewinding my decisions. I'm just going to shove, I'm going to delete the method and shove the code that used to be in the method back up in the branches of the case statement. We'll do that. Now, earlier I said that duplication was cheaper than the wrong abstraction, but now we're starting to see abstractions, and I'm just going to go and abstract away some duplication. I'm going to put the cruft back up in here. So in gilded rows, I no longer need that. What I really need to do is be able to get item. And the way I need to get an item is it's that. That's how I'm going to get it. I, if I just knew the class name, I could send that message to it, and it would work. And it's actually really easy to figure out the class name. The code's already here. It's this. There it is. That'll get me the class name back. So if I just give that a name, I can send that message to myself, and now I have the right kind of item. I don't, know, I don't need name anymore. So that got simpler. So now I've, I have separated the reason I'm switching from the thing I do when I switch. And I can just forget about what's inside that class form method. I don't really care anymore. It just answers the right class. It's going to work. It's going to hand back a thing that can answer the message I want to send to it. And now tick looks like that. And these now, so I'm rewinding the complexity. I don't need this anymore. I have items in every case, so I'll get rid of all that. And now here's the whole body of code that I have. I'm holding an instance of the correct item object, and I just send it the tick method. So we have four different, down at the bottom there, you can see we have four different kinds of item classes. But from Gilded Rose's point of view, item is a role. It doesn't think of it like this. It thinks of it like that. It, it just, you just need someone in there that can answer that API, that knows those messages. It's a duct type, if you will. And if you look at the code I have now, the message passing works like this. Like all these messages get forwarded, and if you had a foo that had a Gilded Rose that sent those messages, it would look like this. And so now I'm in a situation like this. When, when an object's only purpose is to forward messages somewhere else, you have to wonder if it justifies it exi its existence. And this actually is a code smell that has a name. It's middleman. So if that's all that Gilded Res, Res does, it probably shouldn't exist. But it turns out it, does, it still does something important. Given a string like normal, it can figure out what item class, what class plays the appropriate item role. And so now I'm going to use another word that you should love. You should love this word, right? Gilded rows. The only thing that Gilded rows is, it's an item factory. I just need to figure out how to get the right object, and then I can send it a message. We, we've simplified our problem by separating the thing I'm switching on from the thing I do when I switch. We've divided those things in half, so I can make things. Uh, code can know less. We can do smaller things. I don't need to know what they do. I just need to know how to get the right one. And so I'm going to change this code to reflect the reality. I'm going to make Gilded Rose a module. I'm going to say for. Some people put new. They make a new method on module. And I just can't bear that. But it's OK with me if you do it that way. So I'm going to make that a class method because I'm calling it. I'm no longer keeping an instance of anything. So I don't need an adder reader. Um, all these middleman messages now, since you're, you're really going to talk to the item that you get back when you call for all these messages, the, they just go away. So now this is what we have. And the way you use it is you send four to Gilded Rose, and it gives back an item. And it's the item that you talk to. And so now that we've fixed the Gilded Rose, I'm going to take, turn my attention to the, item, the classes that play the item role. They have, there's a lot of duplication in here that we've been tolerating for a long time. They all have this in them. And I'm going to, use, I'm going to create an inheritance hierarchy and clean that up. I'm going to make a little item class, push all that stuff up to it. Then all these guys, I can delete that code from all these guys and make them subclasses of item. Now, despite what you may have heard, inheritance is not evil. And I can tell you exactly when it's safe to use it. Here's what you want. You want a shallow, narrow hierarchy. You don't want it to be deep, and you don't want it to be wide. All right? Shallow, narrow. You would like the subclasses to be, OK, this is, I'll, t I'll say this twice. You want the subclasses to be at the leaf nodes of your object graph. 
right? So you have objects know about other objects know about other objects. Down at the out at the end of your sort of tree, there are objects that then don't know about any other things, right? So we want the subclasses to be the leaf nodes of the object graph to be at the edge, and we want all the, the subclasses to use all of the code in the superclass. Now I'm going to repeat that again: shallow, narrow subclasses at the leaf nodes, and subclasses use all the behavior in the superclass. If that is the problem you have, there is no better solution than inheritance, and you are free to use it. So however, although that, I, I, I love inheritance. I use it in, in appropriate ways, and it is, it is not evil, but sometimes we are. You, mu you might be. And this, it's easy to get inheritance wrong, and this tree has a little problem. And it's this. I don't like this. The public API of item is quality and days remaining, and the public API of those four subclasses contains one additional method, tick. And I think that superclass ought to play the item role, which means to me it's got to implement tick. And the question then becomes, what is the appropriate implementation of tick to put in the superclass? You could uh, define tick and have it raise an error that says subclasses have to implement tick. You could do that. I do that sometimes. But here, I think there's a default implementation that's appropriate, and it's this. Do nothing. I think that's, that's perfectly okay with me. Tick to do nothing. And now, I did that because the inheritance hierarchy bothered me. I'm just, gonna, I'm just removing code now. Now that I've done that, you might notice something about uh, Sulphurus's implementation of tick. It overrides item. It subclasses item to override tick to do exactly what the superclass does. And what that means is that here, it would be equally correct to say this, which means that this class is not necessary. And all the intermediate complexity that I created when I, as I was following this refactoring just went away. There's no more sulfurous class. So I'm going to do one last thing. We're almost finished here. So this case statement contains two different types of information. It contains a set of string to class mappings, and it contains the algorithm to hook them up. And I contend to you that case statements are meant for business logic, and this doesn't really feel like business logic. This feels like configuration information. And so I'm going to just extract configuration data here. I'm going to make a hash, and then I'm going to change the algorithm to just be the algorithm that uses that hash. Now, in real life, this would probably go through some transitions where if the, now the hash can change independently of the algorithm that matches these things up. And if you find the hash changing a lot, you might be tempted to maybe make it a YAML file. And if you find the YAML file changing a lot, you might be tempted to put it in the database. Now I can vary that data independently of this rule about how they get hooked up together. And so that's it. That's the whole refactoring. We've got a bunch of small objects now instead of small methods. Here's the whole code. I got item. In the, in the Gilded Rose module, there's an item class, and then there's three item subclasses, each of which contains a tick method. There's a, there's a set of configuration information and that's, that's used by this algorithm to decide what item class is appropriate for what string. Here's the squint testable version of small objects, and this is it compared to the original big conditional. Now, that's interesting. In the small objects thing, it looks like it's nested too deep, but it's not. I just have the classes inside the modules, right? So that is only really one level of indenting. It, the more interesting comparison here is the squint test between the intermediate solution, the small method solution, and the small object solution. Notice that small objects is a little bit longer, but the colors are clustered more tightly together. So we have really uh, distilled the things that change together in single places. Here's the uh, flog scores that we used to have. So, okay, I have time to make you guess. I made a bunch of small objects. What's the flog score? Well, uh, 15. But you know what? Okay, here. And let's go. What's in the intermediate complexity? We'll come back to that. I like the 15 guess. That was an excellent guess. And you'll know why in a minute. Here's the intermediate complexity scores. All right, so I got this. Th that 33 vastly overstates the complexity of the final solution, and, and it's because of this. When you had the first thing was one class, the whole Gilded Rose class, and you got to kind of know all about that class. And the second solution, the one with small methods, it was the Gilded Rose version 2, right? It was a single class, and you got to kind of know. you got to hold that class in your head. This third solution is a bunch of small classes. It's a bunch of different classes, and you don't need to reason about all of them at once. 
As a matter of fact, you really only need to read the most complicated object in there, and the most complicated class is a backstage class, and it flocks to 12, close to the 15. And the average complexity of the set of classes in that final solution is seven. And so I contend to you, the complexity has fallen by 75% because I made many small objects. And so now I'm going to circle back around to my task, implement conjure. Take a minute and imagine how to do it. There's a the code that makes all the tests pass. Here's how I use it. And now we're done. All right, so summary. When you were new at this, they told you dry. All right, don't repeat yourself. And I'm not saying it's bad, and I'm not saying that duplication is good, but I'm telling you that if your choice is between duplication and the wrong abstraction, you should choose duplication. Trying to fix a problem by increasing the complexity of the wrong abstraction is like chasing a beach ball on the outgoing tide. Every time you take a stroke, it recedes ahead of you, and pretty soon you're out way over your head. It's very hard to fix those problems. Next, don't try to get to the future. Open, closed. Write code that can adapt to the future when it arrives. New requirements. This requirement to implement Conjured was the impetus to make a change. The only, it gives you the information you need about how to make a choice about how to rearrange your code now so that you can do the next thing. Kent Beck has a, Kent Beck who's, uh, has a wonderfully succinct way to put this. He says, make the change easy and then make the easy change. He, said, he actually put it a little bit longer. He said, make the change easy, this might be hard, and then make the easy change. And so we spent 99% of this talk making the change easy. And then it took one slide to make the easy change. At the core of this, at the underpinnings of all this, is this idea of making small objects, making objects that have a single responsibility. And finally, trust the principles of object-oriented design. They let you predict the consequences of your code arrangement choices. And learning something about what those consequences are is going to let you raise your game. Metrics are useful, but they're fallible, but opinions are no more precise. Like use metrics to give you another body of information about how complicated your code are, your code is, and then learn the rules of object-oriented design so that you can choose which direction you want to go in. Um, intermediate refactorings often make code more complicated. But if you know the rules, you can trust yourself to work through complexity and finally reach more open closed code that's simpler and smaller and that lets you have uh, straightforward, changeable, beautiful code. I'm Sandy Metz. I wrote this book. I'm, I'm writing this book. You can, it'll be in the slide deck. I'm teaching in London. There's a public course in London coming up in June and July in case you're from over there. Uh, thanks to you all, and thanks to Jim Warwick, who gave me this card. Oh, sorry.